This is Andhra Pradesh, AP to its friends, India's fourth largest state, and for food lovers across the nation, home to some of India's spiciest cuisine. Until recently, it's been a largely agricultural economy, and with a huge annual rice production of 18 million tons, it's still known as the rice bowl of India. We've come to AP's bustling capital city, Hyderabad, famous for its signature dish, the biryani, for the pearl trade and its passion for cricket and hockey. But these days, in the new and modernizing India, the gongs go to Hyderabad's fast expanding high tech city, its emerging pharmaceutical industries, its IT prowess, and all things digital. Not far from downtown Hyderabad is this government run orphanage. This is not exactly shining India, but the girls are well cared for, nicely dressed, and morale is good. Look at these lovely faces. Their delight as they strain to see themselves on the screens of our cameras. These girls look as happy and energized as any children privileged to be well fed and dressed anywhere the world over. But now look closer, beyond the smiles to how their futures will unfold. As these girls grow to be young women, many of them, indeed most, will be anything but happy. This is because there exists a major problem for literally millions of India's forgotten women. Seeing and hearing such smiles and laughter, it's hard to believe their road ahead spells danger in ways in which it is hardly possible for Westerners to imagine. I'm Anjali Guptara, and I've come to India to find out why women from the bottom rung of India's ubiquitous caste system, where everyone has their place in society, high or low, I'm here to discover why, after 60 years of independence and India's enormous economic growth, why so many, especially women, are dealt such a cruel hand and are still so oppressed in a society where freedom, democracy and wealth are so highly prized. No religion, no caste. Like many patriotic songs, the future hoped for is quite a contrast to today's reality. For despite what is often believed outside of India, caste remains the iron fist of a religious dogma little changed from its origins 3,000 years ago. So to ask why the lives of ordinary Dalit women remain right at the bottom of the caste ladder, we visited Professor Sudharani at the Ambedkar Open University. Professor Rani is herself a Dalit, one of those exceptional Dalit women who has gained not only education, but high academic honour and recognition throughout the world. I asked Dr. Rani, why have Dalit women not found freedom in the way that women in the West have? Dalit women are considered intrinsically impure in Indian caste system. So caste system uh, uh, puts several restrictions, like, you know, they treat in the caste ladder the Brahmin, Kshatriya, Vaishya, Shudra, and the Dalits comes in the lowest rank, the last ladder. They are outside the Chaturvarna, fourfold division of the caste system, uh, which enshrined in the Smritis and uh, the Dharmasasras. They are at the lowest rank of the section, Dalits per se. And Dalit women, uh, she comes at the lower, lowermost part of the ladder, caste ladder. So being at the lowermost part, she has to take the burden of the um, the caste as well and as a Dalit woman uh, we is it's been theorized that you know Dalit women face triple burden the burden of caste the burden of class the burden of the gender discrimination so uh, these three uh, kinds of uh, discrimination the uh, three kinds of burden Dalit women face on them as uh, uh, the poorest of the poor that is the Dalit sections and uh, as a being at the lowermost section, like, you know, in the caste ladder, uh, Dalits are cons considered as an impure community because of their occupations, because of their uh, several other restrictions imposed by the caste Hindus. 
and uh, as a women also this part is uh, not much debated these days within the dalit community dalit women are being victimized victimization from within the dalit community was confirmed to us by ap's inspector general of police s umapati he spoke to us of the latest figures which show a serious increase both in dowry crime and domestic violence and as we discovered within the dalit community itself disfiguring and murderous attacks against women are both frequent and shocking I'm here with Dr. Beryl D'Souza, who works as a medical doctor in the clinic, working with women from the slums. We're going to talk to Jangama, who was attacked in an incident of domestic violence two years ago. So what she's saying is that um, she's 27 years old, so 10 years ago she got married. After three years her husband started abusing her. He's also an alcoholic, he's a lorry driver and he drinks a lot and be comes back home drunk and then beats her. Two years ago he was very angry with her. He came home drunk in the morning and beat her up to really bad in the morning, came back in the evening put kerosene on her and threw a lit matchstick onto her and she caught on fire and was in flames and he watched her burn for several minutes before he actually quenched the fire with, by throwing water on her and then he watched her suffer and struggle for five six hours before he called for help uh, he told her before he was calling for help that you must not tell anybody that it was i who put fire on you because your sons will die there'll be nobody to look after you your children if our sons die Dr. D'Souza, how common are such incidents of domestic violence? Is it widespread across the country? Is it focused particularly in slums and Dalit communities? Tell us what your experiences have been. Yes, domestic violence is certainly very common in our country, all across our country, in all classes of society, in various castes. It is more so a problem in the slums, among migrant workers. Um, it's hugely linked to the fact of the value of women in Indian society, and there is always um, it is always true that in women in Indian society are second-class citizens and they are seen more as a burden either to their father or to their husband or to their sons. In the slum that Jangama comes from, there have been over the last one year three other incidents of burns related to uh, domestic violence either from the husband or from the parents and the three other women who were victims actually succumbed to their injuries. Um, as I was saying, domestic violence is very multifactorial in, in its causation and there is no one single one cause as to why it exists and why it is prevalent and why it will continue to be prevalent. Such dreadful injuries inflicted on Dalit women, and in many cases murder, are an all too common occurrence within the Dalit community. But well equal to such violence within homes and marriage is the violence that flows from the outlawed practice of dowry. Dowry is simply a payment from the bride's family to the groom's, or the other way round, at the time of the marriage. These days, if you're rich enough, the payment may be made in refrigerators, televisions, jewellery and cash. In the Dalit community, the payments may be purely financial and usually from the bride's family to the groom's. Dowries can be crippling for the bride's family and if they fail to pay what is demanded by the in-laws, the consequences can be devastating. Indian newspapers regularly carry stories of brides who have been tortured, seriously injured, burnt to death or forced to commit suicide. The Dowry Prohibition Act of 1961, amended in 1984 and 1986, appears to have made little impact on this practice, as dowry deaths in India continue to rise and stand at present at around 6,000 a year. Dowry, even though it's officially banned for several, I mean, about more than 25 years now, it still is part and parcel of, of an Indian woman's life and an Indian family life. And even in the most educated and culturally forward families, it's still a practice that is linked very strongly to how a woman is treated even prior marriage the amount of education she will receive and the kind of life that she will have after marriage. We have a large incidence of dowry related issues. We have had our, pers our patients being abused physically, even burnt. We've had some of our patients even burnt to death and we were too late to intervene. We've had uh, women being rejected and left homeless because they were not able to meet the dowry needs. Uh, the dowry is one social evil that is hugely linked to the gender disparity that we have and the, the value that women has in Indian society is definitely challenged because of the dowry. You know, because of the dowry, I think well-meaning families are dismayed to have a daughter and 
the investment that the family would put into a daughter is also reduced because it's always at the back of the mind in the family that at some point or other they have to incur this huge, huge debt or um, financial challenge in order to get her married. Dowry is one of the main reasons behind the rampant practice both of female infanticide and sex-selective abortion. After all, sons provide the income, but a daughter to marry may well promise extreme financial burdens and loans with unpayably expensive interest. It's how many Dalit families end up in bonded labour. In this particular state, female in infanticide is not so blatantly seen as it is in North India, like in the states of Punjab and Rajasthan. Having said that, there is definitely the gender disparity uh, in the antenatal period and every family would hope and pray for a, for a male boy or male baby. Uh, personally, we haven't really seen instances of inf infanticide at our clinic. We have had to deal with uh, a particular slum where we work in where girl babies are being sold because it's an economic option to help the family pay off its debts. Where, as, where would it be sold to? Uh, sold to brokers. As you are aware of Andhra Pradesh is mainly is a huge, it's like number one in human trafficking in the country of India and there is a huge business on, in trafficking girl babies so they're sold into other families and then actually reared for the trafficking flesh trade and, and sent out into the large brothels along our national highway. So even as babies they're sold to be prostitutes? In, in, they're sold into families to, or into homes to be sold to become prostitutes, yes. Although now illegal, in villages as well as towns and cities, diagnostic teams with ultrasound scanners which detect the sex of a child advertise with catch lines such as spend 600 rupees now and save 50,000 later. According to UNICEF, up to 50 million girls are missing from India's population as a result of systematic gender discrimination. Illegal though it is, the relatively vast sums demanded for dowry payments are the cause of long-term misery not just for the brides themselves, but also for their families. For India is famous for its loan sharks, or in particular, the manifestation of an especially cruel system of debt and loan repayment known as bonded labour. Curiously, in 1976, India led the way in South Asia by its Bonded Labour Abolition Act. But today, the practice still flourishes. For instance, in brick kilns like this one, across the nation it's estimated 5 million workers are in bonded labour, and most of them women. What exactly is bonded labour? Well, you take out a loan. The interest rates are so high, you have to pay back what you can by working for the loan shark. A kind of self-mortgage. It's always a long-term relationship. It's between an employee and employer, which comes about either by a loan, or sometimes by custom or by force. It's regarded as a form of modern-day slavery, for among other reasons, it's denial to the worker to choose his or her employer to renegotiate a contract or to discuss its terms. So bonded labour comes about through a variety of circumstances, not just dowry. It can flow from any large family expense, such as a medical need, the cost of education, or just food and shelter. These and other reasons are all likely to trigger the requirement of a loan. The loans are easy come, but not easy go. The repayments are punitive, with high compound interest with rates of between 60 to 80% annually. The women at work in this brick kiln are typical of bonded labourers. Their extraordinary ability to balance bricks on their heads is not to be compared to carrying water from the well, perhaps just once a day. Apart from the rainy season, they work 12 to 14 hours a day in the baking heat all year round. At a weight of over 70 pounds a load, the bricks cause damage to their spines, with premature disc wear and damage to the spinal facet joints. Many of the women complain of arm and leg pain, and the damage in later life can cause considerable suffering. We were able to find an official from the Brickworks and asked him to explain his view on the employment issues here. Ravi, do you own this land and the Brickworks or you just manage the people and the projects? I'm the owner of this entire work. I don't own the land, but I own the, the workers. Uh, I will pay a huge amount of money to people and get them here to work for me. Uh, so they'll be here till that money is over. In the West, people think that bonded labour means exploitation. What do you think about that? I don't get involved uh, too much on in this. Uh, they have a leader who, who makes arrangements. He gives some money, and we uh, work with the leader of the group. 
who actually supplies uh, people for us to work here. What do you think of the conditions that the workers live in? The, the conditions of their living is not as convenient. Sometimes no toilets, no uh, running water, but still they, they like to come here, work, knowing that the living conditions are bad. Do you think that there's anything else that you could do as their manager of these people to make their living conditions more comfortable? I am doing all that I can to give them a comfortable stay, making their house a little more comfortable so that the snakes and the scorpions don't come and bite them. More than this, we can't really make their stay all luxurious. Uh, we can't uh, do it because it's, uh, we have to run the business. While we were filming, our translator spoke informally to Jesna, Aruna and Mamata, three of the women on the site, and told us their stories. Aruna is the most senior and migrated here from Maharashtra. She works up to 14 hours a day and fires the bricks in the kiln, for which she has paid just 150 rupees a day. Jesna on the left here was married at 16, had a baby at 17, and since her husband left her earlier this year, she is now divorced. Jesna has migrated from Orissa to support not only herself and her baby, but at their insistence, her in-laws as well. She earns 80 rupees a day, and now she's 18, she carries 12 bricks at a time. Unlike Mamata next to her, who carries only 10, because she is just 12 years old. Vatipali, our translator, takes up the story. Mamata stopped school because uh, her parents cannot uh, afford to send her to school. Uh, very poor people and difficult. Um, so she left the school and she came, uh, she came here to work. And that's the situation with her. And when I asked her, uh, would you like to come, uh, if there is a facility for you to come and study or, or uh, be uh, in, a, uh, in a residential uh, school where, they, where we provide uh, accommodation for you and the school, she says, uh, I can't come because, uh, uh, because uh, my parents have taken money from the uh, owner of uh, this business. Uh, so once uh, we have to give mo that money back, then only uh, I, I'll be released, which is not possible. So I have to continue to work here uh, and be like this. This is the rice husk, how it comes off from the paddy field when it's all been dried, and then crush it. Husk come off and the rice is here. At first sight, this could be taken as an idyllic rural scene. Workers in the paddy fields of Andhra Pradesh. In years past, it could have been the subject of a painting, typical of the romanticization of rural life that was popular in 19th century Britain. But there's nothing romantic or even comfortable in the story here. Although we will meet smiling faces, in India there is always something more than meets the eye. I'm here with Vasanta, who is working harvesting the rice in the field with six other ladies. I'm going to ask her how life is like for her. Vasanta, how many hours do, a day do you harvest the rice? I'm working from 11 o'clock to 5.30, 6 o'clock every day. The season for harvesting is for one month and later on again we have to plough the ground and we have planting the rice. We have to wait another two months for a paddy to grow and then we again do the harvesting. Vasanta, do you support your whole family through the work that you do? When I work here, I get rice and that will go for us for, for some time. For planting, we get cash, so that we will use uh, to buy other things in the family. During the planting season, how much are you paid? Normal wages is 60 rupees per day. And that's what at first doesn't meet the eye. For 60 rupees, which in Western currency is around one and a quarter US dollars, actually represents only half the legal minimum wage for agricultural workers in Andhra Pradesh. What is more, these workers, who are in bonded labour, only get work for six months of each year. For each plantation, there are three harvests annually. So for a month, they prepare the ground and sow. Then there's two months without work till it's time for a month of harvesting. And then the cycle repeats itself. What this means is that there is no work for the women in those fallow periods, and certainly as Dalits and women, no other kind of employment is available for them. In rural India, their caste subgroup strictly specifies the work they do. So spread over the year, given they are working for six months only, 
What this means in financial terms is the women have to exist on the equivalent of just 30 rupees a day, which works out at 123 pounds or 200 US dollars per year. They do get a little rice to take home at harvest, but the bonuses don't stretch further than that. This is what an artist cannot paint and the camera cannot see, that these people live in the most extreme poverty. India is a country of both wealth and poverty, and on the downside, the World Bank estimates 42% of India's population live under the global poverty line of $1.25 a day, which means a third of the global poor now reside in India. But even given those gross levels of poverty, at the equivalent of 30 rupees a day, just 64 cents, these forgotten women are literally the poorest of the poor. That may be an overused phrase, but it is a ghastly and hopeless state to be in. These women that we met, and there are many like them, their status as Dalits and their bonded labour does not permit them any opportunity to improve their lot. Their situation is as pitiful as it is outrageous. It is an atrocious example of both exploitation and oppression. As they say, in India, however shocking, there is always something more than at first meets the eye. We're in Venkatapu, a rural village in Andhra Pradesh. We're here with Sandhya. A year ago, when she was 15 years old, she was the victim of a gang rape. Sandhya, could you tell us about your experience? The day I was about to go to school, my friend Rekha belongs to upper caste, told me not to go to school, uh, rather my mother is sick, so we will stay at home. And the mother asked both of us to go to the school and uh, get the flowers. When we were doing that, and, uh, the Narsimlu, a man, again uh, from upper caste, came and uh, hold my hair and uh, from the back and he dragged me to the fields. And uh, then he called uh, Parshramlu and other four of them, um, four of the men came to that place and they forced me to drink some soft drink. I lost my conscience and at 12.30, 1 o'clock I got my conscience back where I found that it was uh, terrible to see that I was uh, used and I was uh, crying and uh, at 1 o'clock in the night they dropped me back. Rajamani is a women's activist with the Dalit Bahujan Front. She helped Sandhya after the incident. Rajamani. How did you come to know of Sandhya's situation and what did you do to help her? We have seen this in the newspaper uh, saying a school going girl was trapped by upper caste people. When the relatives of uh, the girl uh, went to the police station, uh, the police did not register any complaint, any case on the accused. Rather, uh, they were delaying purposefully knowing that it is upper caste people. So on the police station itself, the relatives called the journalists and told the story to the press. And that's how uh, it came in the paper. And we saw the information in the paper and immediately we have come and we have put more force on the police to file the case. The Dalit Bahujan Front is one of the more well-known organizations in Andhra Pradesh that champions the human rights of Dalits and particularly the rights of women. How necessary this is can be gauged from Sandhya's story in Venkatabu. Take the reputation of the police. Undoubtedly, some aspects are excellent with many committed and hard-working officers. But there is another side to the story, which is far less honourable and deeply affected by caste prejudice and persecution. The fact is, the cases of many rapists never reach court. Their accusers are either terrified of contact with the police, or, as happened with Sandhya, when a complaint is made, it's disregarded because these girls are Dalits. The rapists go free because they are high caste. This caste bias perverts the course of justice, but its misguided perpetrators see nothing wrong, as they sincerely believe the caste teaching of the sacred scripture, which says that women are as worthless as dogs. Young Dalit girls almost expect to be raped by upper caste men. Though Sandhya seems well adjusted now, and turned out for her interview wearing the best her wardrobe has to offer, there is always a legacy. To quote psychologist Rajat Mitra's recent 10-year study on sexual assault, for a Dalit woman, the feeling of being dehumanized by the rape and her general anguish at being at the lowest place inevitably connects with her other sufferings and discriminations. It's a potent mix, leading often to deep depression and suicide. Dr. Mitra also comments that rapists seem to take maximum pleasure in humiliating their Dalit victims' origins and backgrounds.
and notes with dismay the almost ritualistic ostracism which occurs within the Dalit community after the rape has occurred. If you are a woman and a Dalit, how deeply true it is that you are twice oppressed. So we're looking at this as an everyday situation. We're looking at girls who go to college, girls who go to school, being told, be careful, don't look at boys this side, don't, don't answer back to boys who might tease you, who might sing songs with sexual indentors, because they might then throw acid on your face, because they are in love with you and you're not in love with them. In India, we also have international statistics that there is a rape committed every 34 minutes. And we know that of all the cases that go to court, only 5% get convicted. We seem to have lost respect to a very large number of people. We do not even hold them in dignity. How can we say we are developed, we are developing? These are issues we also want not just the so-called intelligentsia, the academically qualified. You don't need to be so qualified to ask a question, why would you not want to respect me, whatever I am? Why would you want to show your power trying to put me down? Why would you not want to give me something that is rightfully mine? And all of our development programs is geared towards making people especially people at the bottom rung, to become their own first line of defense, respecting everybody and everybody's rights, but never forgetting that you need to challenge. If you don't question, you will continue to get enslaved. we travelled north to Belgaum in the same state of Karnataka. Belgaum itself is an ancient city, though today it's increasingly industrialised. But the large Belgaum district is home to almost 1,300 small towns and villages. And it's to one of these, near Sondati, where we are going in search of a famous temple dedicated to the goddess Yalama. We have found it about eight kilometres drive out from the town. We've come on a Tuesday, which is one of the noisiest days to visit. Tuesdays and Fridays are special days at the Yalama temple, and devotees will queue on average for nine hours to see the goddess in her most holy shrine. Why exactly? Well, Yalama is one of the Hindu pantheon who gives you things. Anything you ask, you'll have it. That's if you ask in the right way. It's bound to be popular. So it's no surprise in the approach to the temple courts to find a festive atmosphere brimming over with expectation and excitement. Yet it's puzzling too, perplexing even, since for all its years of existence, the temple dedicated to the goddess Yalama has maintained a dark and dreadful secret about the oppression of women. Yalama's dark secret concerns temple prostitution. Temple prostitutes, known by a variety of names, but most commonly as Devadasi, have been in existence in India for at least 10 centuries. They are often associated with the worship of the goddess Yalama to whom they are dedicated. By law, since 1988, when the practice was abolished by a number of states including Karnataka, in theory, Devadasi ceased to exist. But the practice has anything but died out. Young girls are dedicated or married to the temple and its goddess at as young as four years old. By the time they reach 12 years, they will be serving the physical appetites of the Hindu priest or prominent men within the temple circle. It always was exploitation, it still is, and it is supposed to have stopped. But that's the dark secret. Young Dalit women are still sold to temples by parents whose poverty is overwhelming. No, there is no Devadasi. There is no Devadasi. What does it mean? See, Devadasis are nothing but they are also as Jogamas. They were Bhikkhu Bhikkhu, they were Jogamas. Yeah, same thing. Same thing. But there are no Devadasi over here. There is no any Devadasi Padati over here. There is no... Yes. 
according to God's rule, there is no Devdasi. This is all false. There is no any Devdasi over here. The priest we spoke to was kind and helpful. Initially, we were told we could not film in the temple, but he rescued us and gave us the five-star tour. Suddenly, while we were speaking to him, this sprightly elderly lady turned up. We were pretty sure from her necklace and medallions, which is how you recognize them, it's like a badge of office, that she was a former Devadasi, or Jogni, as they are known in these parts. The priest told us she was 102, but he denied the existence of Devadasis today so vehemently that we later felt we should check out the Devadasi story for ourselves. We didn't have far to go, for a village called Kapulgati is just nearby. Here in the village of Kapulgati, most houses belong to Devadasis. The village is dominated by these single parent families. There are 38 Devadasis, there are 58 Devadasi children. Before the Abolition Act in 1988, Devadasis lived within the temple precincts. After that, to continue their so-called sacred work, the temple authorities moved the Devadasis into sometimes purpose-built villages where all the homes belonged to Devadasis. This is Lalita. Lalita was dedicated to the temple when she was only three years old. At the age of 12, she became a practicing Devadasi. My name is uh, Lalita. I'm 20 years old. I'm dedicated in the age of uh, three to four years to the temple prostitution and I was every day go and come play around near the temple. At the 12 age I was dedicated to sleep with the priests. I continue to do this Devadasi work. The man comes in the evening, knocks at the door and asks me to sleep with him and pays me little amount of money like 30 rupees and I survive with that. Mahananda has been a Devadasi since she was 12 years old. She now has two daughters, aged 10 and 13. Being Devadasi, it's difficult for me. Society looks me very down. It's very hard for me. It's the things I can't buy. I go for the manual job. I earn 40 rupees per day. And this is not enough to educate my children. I don't want my children to go through the difficulty which I have gone through. My parents have done the mistake in my life. Emanar is 19 years old. She's been a Devadasi, a temple prostitute, since she was 13. Generations of her family before her were also Devadasis. I have blessed with two and a half years old child, and the, the child asked me all the time, where is the father? I don't have any answer. In the age of 13 years, I was puberty, and my parents, as a generationally, was asked to go for the temple prostitute. And also we were going through a lot of financial crisis. And I have to go every day as a daily basis and sleep with this priest and they pay the money. That used to be the survival to fill our stomachs. In the age of 17, my mom said, you know, you need to quit this job because of the health factors, the HIV, and everybody's dying. So I feel like getting out of this. My name is Emanawa. I'm 25 years old. I myself have chosen to go to the temple prostitution because my mother also is a temple prostitute. She never taken care of me. I saw many teenagers are running to the temple and having sex with the priest and I also went because of the financial, because of the crisis, because of the difficulties and I need the food. And now I have one four years old girl child and I don't want these difficulties to carry on, so kindly help me. This village of Kapugati with its 38 Devadasis and 58 Devadasi children is conveniently up the road from the Elama temple. For the Devadasis, it's all women and children. No fathers, of course, because of their mother's situation. The children are illegitimate. For these families, apart from those who visit at night, they have no men in Kapugati. Devadasis and their present-day existence are widely denied. It is, after all, an embarrassing blot on India's democratic reputation. Yet there are government figures available, and in Karnataka state alone, there are believed to be 23,000 active Devadasis. Like many government statistics, the true figure is likely to be higher. So why did the temple priest we spoke to deny the existence of Devadasis so vehemently? Probably because of the clash of cultures. First, Devadasis are illegal. 
Dedicating girls to a deity was officially prohibited soon after independence, and in common with other states, Karnataka outlawed all Devadasi rituals, ceremonies and exploitation. Penalties were high, though probably not high enough, with up to five years in prison for those responsible for dedications. Though some police action has been effective in places like Sondati, there's no case recorded which has been successfully brought to court. The culture clash is that this is part of Hindu temple practice which goes back at least several centuries, though it's probably not sanctioned by the Hindu scriptures themselves. There's clearly a reluctance to break the tradition, but the legalities have forced these women out of the temples themselves and now they are visited in their own homes. It is a disgraceful situation with, as we heard, many health risks, an embrace of poverty and social marginalisation of the worst kind for the mothers and their illegitimate children. Yes, this is still India and it's how the other half lives. Despite the poverty, there's no shortage of wealth in this enormous country. According to Forbes magazine, India is home to the largest number of billionaires in Asia and the millionaires are doing pretty well too. Well, you don't have to have a gold-plated wallet to shop in one of India's fast-growing luxury shopping malls. That is, if you are on a Western salary or you're one of India's better-paid upper-middle-class workers. Yet since 85% of Indians earn less than $2.5 a day, retail therapy is definitely seen by the majority as the province of the super-rich. Still, the have-nots simply don't have, and there is not much sign of change, which is close to tragic when you consider the unbridled exploitation which can insinuate and flourish in the poverty of stifled communities, especially young vulnerable women. Mumbai's red light district is a very smelly place. The stench of rotting meat, the scraps thrown for the dogs, the general whiff of decay, plus the putrid smell of body odor and stale sex is everywhere. There is a huge bustle of people about and the traffic is all night through. You can see the girls on the streets or on the doorways. There are also cages for younger girls which were too dangerous to film. But this is undoubtedly the lowest life Mumbai has to offer. This is Mumbai's heartbeat, where crime, exploitation and the worst of human lust and greed can all be found. The women most exploited? As we found, undoubtedly, the Dalits. If you are a woman and a Dalit, and you've been trafficked, welcome to the home of Bombay's nightmares. Kamathipura is Mumbai's oldest and Asia's largest red light district, with around 100,000 women sex workers. It is strange that in a country which is otherwise socially so conservative, where women and men marry early in life and a divorce is little known, just one in a hundred, that prostitution seems such a widely accepted activity. However, the actual practice of monogamy seems to apply more to women than to men. Nonetheless, the real bulk of customers are drawn from migrant workers. In cities like Mumbai, Delhi, Kolkata and Chennai, the commercial centres are a temporary home to literally millions of men who are far away from their wives and families. They provide the demand and unscrupulous profiteers provide the supply. This means that spreading of health risks, especially from HIV AIDS, is significant, as ignorance persists about transmission of such diseases. Half the women at work in Kamathipura are HIV positive. Yet we were told that many men refuse condoms, and equally some say if the sex workers just washed their hands, everything would be okay. AIDS is a killer and the impact from such places is just a matter of time. Where do the young women in Kamathipura actually come from? Each big centre across the nation is a little different. In Kolkata, for instance, many of the girls are born into brothels, whereas in Mumbai, most of the girls are sold into prostitution. Bonded labour works just as much in the sex industry as it does in the brickworks or out on the fields. Once again, so much of this is poverty-driven. Why is it that increasing numbers of young girls from Nepal and Bangladesh are ending up in the brothels of Mumbai and the other large centres? The first answer is that in Mumbai, the trafficking of young girls is a billion dollar a year industry. 
and the second answer is as painful as can be imagined. When a whole family faces starvation, as is certainly the case in far too many parts of India, some families will be forced to take desperate measures to avoid the malnutrition and death of their whole family. And that means selling their girl children into sex slavery. This desperation does not condone trafficking. It does, however, illumine the intolerable situation of family distress which so quickly plays into the hands of the evil profiteers. They are rarely caught and prosecuted, and there are plenty of them, queuing up to traffic these young girls with no semblance of respect for their human dignity. Profoundly unprincipled exploiters of India's forgotten women, whose only interest is the price tag they can fix on a piece of fresh young meat. Hyderabad is a prime destination for migrant workers from across the country and then they come to Hyderabad city in search of better jobs and better lives and then find themselves living in slums and being paid rates that are far below the national um, the, the legal limit that they're supposed to be paid and health care for them is a major challenge and our clinic is able to cater to their needs and to reach out to this community. Women in these communities and even women all over our country are at risk for major inequalities and gender disparities and this is hugely linked to their access to food and chronic hunger is a huge, huge problem among the women in India. Malnutrition, anemia, they say about 87% of Indian women, Indian women are anemic and that makes them at risk during the antenatal period and during delivery which is why we also have some of the highest maternal mortality rates in our rural areas. As a woman with my roots in India and conscious of all the freedoms and opportunities we have in the West, I came to India to discover something of what it's like to be a woman on the bottom rung of the caste ladder. Frankly, I never thought I'd see what I have seen. The scenes we have reported on domestic violence, dowry crime, sex selective abortion, female infanticide, bonded labor, rape, temple prostitution and human trafficking all those appear to be endemic and widespread in this wonderful but curious country. Wonderful because it's a country where there is so much evidence of its ancient civilization, culture and wisdom, but also its rapid modernization and commitment to democracy. Curious because there is more than enough food in India to feed everyone, yet every day millions have just one poor meal which is hardly enough to sustain them in this life. And curious because, as we have seen, the caste system appears to be the unbreakable spiritual and socially engineered evil that ensures if you are a woman and a Dalit, you are twice oppressed. Well, I am convinced that India's government has much to be proud of. But as a great and growing democracy, today's urgent task must be to address the human rights of its population and the underlying issues of caste, poverty and oppression. In this, India needs the help of the whole world community, governments, NGOs, international business and investors. India's forgotten women are crying for help. It's time to wake up, for this has to change.